All right, let's take our chorus books and turn towards the back. We're going to sing the Christ of the Cross. Find that in the back of your book, chorus book. Not about the wood of the cross, it's about the Christ that was crucified. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. The Christ of the cross, so despised by the world, as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear sin on dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. On the old rugged cross Stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. <laughs> To the Christ of the cross, I will ever be true. His shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday, for by his grace I am saved. And his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross. Till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross. And I'll praise him in glory that day. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I pray that you would be pleased to meet with us here today once again. Even as you promised, where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in their midst. And we need a word from you. And we need your spirit to direct our minds and hearts to your son the lord jesus christ and i 
I thank you for this place to meet. I thank you for the privilege that we have week in and week out to hear of your blessed Son and to glorify you through him and his great work accomplished there at Calvary. And so give us hearts to praise you and to seek Christ, to desire to see him and to remove all distractions from our own hearts and minds. And indeed, Christ alone be exalted. Give you the praise, honor, and glory in his precious name. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and look together again in Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27. And today, my text is going to be from verse 17 down to verse 22, entitled, Iron Sharpeneth Iron. Now, I know that we probably all at one point have quoted this particular verse, especially when you meet with somebody and have an exchange, and out of that exchange you benefit. And perhaps the Lord is pleased to teach you something of himself that you had not thought of previously, and in reality, this type of fellowship you find beneficial. I would say that's what occurs whenever we meet here for worship and gather together. This is iron sharpening iron. And particularly in the knowledge that the iron is the word. That really is the number one way in which God is pleased to teach those of his own, his children. But the picture here in verse 17 is that of, and we've done it before, I know there's modern ways of sharpening knives. I've observed over the years in Africa where they use the machete that they will take and sharpen that machete, sit there a long time getting it sharp before they go out and go to work and before too long, they're sitting back down again and sharpening that machete because a dull tool cannot in any way benefit somebody that is using it. And so I believe here the picture, though, is more to do as we go through the Proverbs, seeing pictures of Christ and how it is that the Lord Jesus Christ is pleased to deal with his people the blessed truths that we know is that Christ did the work and he accomplished that work at Calvary by his death, whereby the scriptures say, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But that doesn't mean that we don't stand in need of sharpening. That the Lord himself, like a true farmer, if you will, that planted the seed and out has grown the fruit of that work. And now that's his harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest. But he continues to work with his people in his providence and through his word. And let's admit it, we all need that correction. We all need that discipline that he brings to each one of his own. It's like we read in Proverbs, we read it, and then over in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. That's what I want us to think about here when it says, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. How the Lord deals with us, first of all, the fact that he would even call us his friend. But he's the friend of sinners. And that means then that we're fallen. And when you consider out of his grace, that eternal grace, those that the Father gave him, that he should come and save, that he cares for each one to such a degree that he'll not lose one for whom he paid that sin debt. Think about a shepherd. He's the good shepherd. We use the idea of a, a farmer laboring in his field and 
assuring the fruit that would come from that field. There's not one fruit for which Christ paid the debt that will ever rot. There's not one child born, stillborn, when it comes to those for whom Christ came and paid the debt. And so what I read here in verse 17, as a man sharpens the countenance of his friend, that is, when you think of the countenance, it has to do with the face. And you can tell a lot about a person and what they're going through by reading their face. And if the countenance of a friend needs sharpening, it means it needs brightening. Well, who is our light? Who is it that is our peace but the Lord Jesus Christ? And that in this flesh, he never leaves us alone. There's much in our flesh that would cause our face to be downfallen or to be angry over situations. But even there, it's iron sharpening iron because not only does God use his word, but he uses his providence to bring us into affliction and lest we should be exalted above measure. And then even when he brings us low by his grace, then he raises us up. And so I see here a, a picture of that sharpening. It doesn't mean in any way that we're getting better and better. Otherwise, we wouldn't need the sharpening. There is that view that somehow once the spirit of God is in you, then your nature is improving and you begin to sin less and less. I was taught that growing up, and that is a terrible deception. One is contrary to the word, but also, if you're honest, it's contrary to your own experience. And so we were in this flesh, and the Lord purposed that. In John 17, he, he prayed to his Father, not that we be taken from the world, but we, we be kept from the evil one. And so, as the friend of sinners, the fact that we can even be called his friend, is by his grace alone and he does bring us through trouble he does bring us through tribulation he does bring us through affliction not to destroy us because when you're going through these experiences sometimes you feel like perhaps that the lord has abandoned you but think again of iron sharpening iron the think of the butcher taking those knives i've never been able quite to do that without putting myself in peril, but some of them are pretty good at it. They, they can take those knives and rub them together, and the next thing you know, it's sharp. It's cutting through that meat. And then when it gets dull, he's going back at it again, sharpening the knife. That in of itself expresses our need as sinners. There's never a time when we don't need the Lord's tender care, and we don't need his dealings in our heart and mind lest we should be lifted up in pride in one sense, but also be discouraged and uh, think that somehow he has abandoned us. He, good shepherd, never abandons his sheep. And yet there's times that just like in Psalm 23, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That rod and staff are for the sheep. The rod in of itself for smacking a, a sheep when it's, Wandering, why do we wander? Well, because we're sheep. Why do we fall? It's because we're fallen sinners. But that rod of his correction is not out of anger or abusive, but for the purpose of correction. And the staff, which has a hook on the end of it, it's for the sheep's protection. The shepherd graciously reaches out there and pulls us back, keep us from going the way we would go. So when you think of iron sharpening iron, there's friction, there's sparks. And uh, even if you look over with me in Hebrews chapter 12, this is the way the writer to the Hebrews was writing for the encouragement of these that were going through difficult times. But whatever God purposes for our particular path, and I will tell you that in his providential grace and how he deals with each of his own, that path is ordered 
specifically for us. It's not just a cookie cut way of, of God dealing with his children the same. And this is where the writer to the Hebrews begins in Hebrews chapter 12, talking about those witnesses in Hebrews 11, when he says, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, it's not that there's all these that have gone before that are sitting up in glory and looking down and watching us run the race. That's not it. But the cloud of witnesses going all the way back there to Abel and what he endured and suffered and Abraham and how the Lord and Moses, how the Lord preserved each one through trial, through affliction, and thereby their faith was strengthened, not to look to themselves, but to look to Christ. And the writer speaks there of those in verse 36, others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Imagine these going through this and the enemies looking on them and saying, oh, so you call yourself children of God? Is that how your God treats you? says, but of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts. It's talking about persecution here. Being brought against these that were the Lord. You talk about affliction. You talk about iron sharpening iron. That even in all of this, the Lord's hand was upon them. And in the mountains and the dens and caves of the earth. And these all having obtained a good report through faith. In other words, through that faith that God gave them to look outside themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ who should come, received not the promise. In other words, they lived and died without seeing the fulfillment of what we see today. That in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. They died without seeing that promise realized. And yet, God was all the while taking care of them and using those afflictions and trials for their good and his glory. God having provided some better thing for us in verse 40, that they without us should not be made perfect. That tells you right there that being made perfect was in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. One time, one place. Those of the Old Testament were not justified in another way than, than any are today other than in that one place sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he says in Hebrews 12, seeing that we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You think you've had a rough day? Well, let's go back and read Hebrews chapter 11, and read the testimony of those that were the Lord's and all that they endured, even for Christ's sake. People kind of pull back and say, for Christ's sake, he wasn't even here yet. Well, it was for Christ's sake. His spirit was in them. It speaks there of Moses that esteemed, verse 26 of Hebrews 11, esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. In other words, God gave him that faith to, to realize that when Christ would come and lay down his life, it would be for his salvation. And that's the spirit that the of Christ that was in him that caused him to endure what he endured all those years in the wilderness endured it for Christ's sake and so that's the cloud of witnesses but he says let us lay aside every weight of, of the sin which does so easily beset us notice it's not plural of the sins but of the sin what is it that the one what is the, the one sin that so easily besets us? Is it not unbelief? That while we are going through trials and afflictions and difficulties, to see the hand of the Lord in it, how many times our heart is unsettled and we act as unbelievers in those times, forgetting that even in that the Lord is directing and he's doing it for his glory and our good. It says, therefore, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Be careful in asking the Lord for patience because patience comes through trials. 
the tribulations, and it's to prove God's grace in upholding each one of his own and not letting him go away. Here again, the iron that sharpens iron, there's friction, there's sparks, there are other things, but to know that the, the true purpose in all of this is that the Lord be glorified and showing just how he keeps such sinners as we are. And that's why it says in verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why did he endure all of that if it were not for such sinners as we are? And to think of him as making us his friend, that's an amazing thought right there, to be reconciled with the Holy God, sinner though I am, but not by God just looking the other way, but through this very suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ that he endured. Verse three, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. This sharp iron sharpening iron is for us not to look on ourselves, but to consider how the Lord is graciously continuing to work in our hearts and our minds that our Minds beyond him, lest we should be weary and faint in our minds. But think about this, verse 4. No matter what the, the temptation, ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Our Lord did. He was tempted and tried in every way, yet without sin. There's not a temptation or trial that any one of his own can face, but what he has already endured it and resisted unto blood. In other words, unto that work at the cross, so that when he laid down his life, he offered himself up to his father as that perfect sacrifice, striving against sin, against the temptation, against the devil, against the world, and all these things that he might be that just savior. And so he says in verse five, and again, this is an exhortation for any of us that are the Lord's. Ye have, ye, ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So here again, looking at iron sharpening iron. Do we need rebuke? Do we need exhortation? Do we need chastening? Thank God that that chastening is an evidence not of his wrath, because Christ bore that wrath on the cross, but an evidence of his love. It says here in verse 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. If a knife could speak and sees that other knife coming and the butcher doing this sharpening, the knife might think, well, what are you doing to me? What's the cause of all this? Look at the sparks. But in all of it, when we consider the Lord's dealings with us, it is in love. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And notice, scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So think of this iron sharpening iron to lift the countenance. It's not, as we're going to read here, going through it is not peaceable. And in many ways, painful. And yet, in the end, when we see God's hand in it, and it isn't the countenance lifted, when we consider that here the Lord has been pleased to use such chastenings to cause us to lift the countenance and to look to him, and the light of Christ to shine on our face. Oh, what a pleasant blessing. And so it says in verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. You should be more concerned if God just leaves you to your own way, to go the way you would go. Here it says, if ye endure chastening, and to endure it means to be built up by it, not just to hunker down, but in the heart strengthened by it, to, to know that it's Christ that's keeping us and not us him. But if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, 
For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastening, chastisement, whereof all are partakers, that is, all that are the Lord's, then are ye bastards and not sons. When the Lord leaves others to themselves and you look out in the world and they don't seem to be afflicted as you are, not just physically, but even in your own soul, the, the stirrings of the soul. Well, if you're not, it's a sign of deadness. A dead heart doesn't feel anything, but those that are chastened of the Lord, it's not just a physical, but his dealings and the exercise of this heart by his spirit is for a gracious purpose. Furthermore, in verse 9, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. I know today there's a push not to use the path to spank. They, you know, psychologists are saying, well, if you do, you're going to damage the child. Well, that's not what the scripture says. And I know there's abuse. It's not speaking here of of using that in any way by way of abuse, but correctly done. It says, and I know that was my case, I was raised with a paddle, but it does give you that respect for then that authority, that father, for not letting you go the way that you would go. If that's so with fathers, shall we not much rather be in subjection of the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. For a few days, it seems like an eternity when you're growing up, but by the time you get into your teens and whatnot, the correction that was done early on should produce that result. They're not constantly, after you're of age and you go out of the home, they're still coming and, and correcting you. So for verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So look at the contrast. The difference with God the Father is as his children, he continues to chasten us. You never grow out of the need because of his love and care for us, that we might be partakers of his holiness. When it says partakers of his holiness, it means in his correcting, and chasing us, we do see that he is just in so doing because he is holy. But there's not an ounce of wrath in God's correction of any of his children. Why? Because the Lord bore it. But there is love and grace in what he does. And that's why it says in verse 11, now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. <laughs> so as the Lord's bringing you through, and it, it's by his determining as to the time and length of any particular affliction, it's not that with that iron sharpening iron, that somehow it's a pleasant thing, like you're, you're giddy and let No, it's grievous, but it's grievous in knowing that we know we deserve far worse. And that if he is chasing in us and scourging in us, it's because of his mercy. His son bore the brunt of his wrath that we deserved, but now the purpose is, as it says in verse 11, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. When you see that fruit of righteousness, this is the peaceable fruit of why Christ died, of righteousness, of that righteousness that he came and earned and established and God imputed there and then at the cross to the account of, of his people. And we can see then why it is that he does not leave us alone, does not leave us to ourselves. It's because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and that this chastening and all that takes place, the iron sharpening iron is the effect. That's the fruit of that righteousness that he came and earned and established unto them which are exercised thereby. Notice this is God's particular attention for his children, for his own. And uh, with the chastening, he gives us his spirit to realize and to see Christ's hand in it all. And there you go. You talk about lifting the countenance. Look at verse 12 of Hebrews 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. 
and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. So that's the purpose of all this. There's a lot more there in our text in Proverbs 27, 17. The more you ponder it, the Lord, by his spirit, giving you understanding, you can see then just how gracious the Lord is, even in his chastenings. And so, continuing on in verse 18 of Proverbs 27. Here again is a picture of Christ. In verse 17, it's a picture of his work in chastening those that are his. Here in verse 18, he's the keeper of the fig tree. It says, Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. So he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. There are a lot of people today that are preaching to Jesus that came to attempt to do a work, to plant a tree, described here as a, a fig tree, and yet there is that fruit that he will never enjoy because they say that man doesn't believe. And so they have a Jesus that has done the labor, done the work, planted the tree, but does not benefit from the fruit thereof because he can't cross man's will. See, that's what's wrong with this popular message being preached today, that somehow man can keep Christ from enjoying the fruit of his labor. Now, those that read the scripture that way, they must understand that that's not the Christ of scripture. And that if any way my will can affect whether or not he receives the reward of his labor, we're in trouble. Because what that does is put man above God. That puts man's will over God's will. Listen to what it says here. Whoso keepeth the fig tree, you see that word shall? I love the shalls of Scripture. Shall eat the fruit thereof. But Christ has done the work. If man could have done the work, then Paul said Christ is dead in vain. But the fact that there's not a man, now if it was up to us to plant this tree and to grow it and to seek some fruit thereof, the only fruit that would be would be rotten fruit. That's all that we can produce, anything that we do. But think of Christ being the keeper of that fig tree. And he shall eat the fruit thereof. If you go over to Isaiah chapter 53, we get to where I like to refer to the gospel according to Isaiah. It's one of the key books in scripture, special to me because it was from this particular word that the Lord showed me I was lost and taught me of Christ in Isaiah 6. But all the way through here, what a beautiful picture we have of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you talk about iron sharpening the iron. Think about what our Lord endured of the hand of his father and the affliction that he went through. He had to be tempted in all things, yet without sin. Here it says in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, when you see the word pleased, it's not, think of a father correcting the son. You know, he's not laughing while he's correcting him, but corrected and dealt with according to his good pleasure, according to his will. That's what's being described here. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. I've had people ask me that. Well, what kind of father would do to, to their son what God did to his son? Well, it wasn't for any sin in his son, but it was because he came willingly to be that sin bearer and to be the substitute for sinners that deserved this wrath. It fell upon him according to God's good pleasure. And we don't find our Lord halting in any way in the face of the hand of his father upon him, knowing that it was for his father's sake that he would endure everything that he endured. It says he hath put him to grief. You think about us being put to grief. We deserve every bit of grief that the hand of God brings our way. But he was the son of God. He was sinless and yet put him to grief the man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And it says, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, 
That statement right there, it doesn't mean that he made his soul sinful, as many want to interpret over from 2 Corinthians 5, 21, when he was made sin. That is an ellipsis that means he was made a sin offering. His soul was made an offering for sin. This wasn't just the physical suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the spiritual, his very soul. And it says there, he shall see his seed. God the Father would see his seed. Whose seed? This is the seed of the one. This is speaking of Christ, that God the Father would see his seed and would prolong his days. And how did he prolong them? Yes, he was put to death, but he raised them again because the work was complete and he ever lives now for eternity to intercede on behalf of those for whom he paid the debt. And the pleasure of the Lord, notice, shall prosper in his hand. He's not going to lose one. Here's the fruit of the fig tree of what he's planted. He will receive the labor. He'll not be robbed of that fruit, either by man's will or by Satan or sin. No. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. God the Father would see the travail of the soul of his son and what? Be satisfied. As I said, no stillborns, that everyone Christ paid the debt, the Father looks upon with satisfaction and also the son. And it says by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. If he bore them and put them away, then they're put away. And therein he rejoices in the fruit of his labor. And so, coming back to verse 18 again, so he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. Think about how the Lord Jesus Christ waited on his master. He looked to his father in all things. He never spoke a word, but what it was directed by God the Father. He never did it an act, but what the, the spirit that was in him caused him to do and to say what he did. And so think here, I know again, people read the scripture selfishly. They look at this and think, okay, what I've got to do then is dedicate myself to God. And if I just do this or I do that, then he's going to honor me. Take yourself out of the picture. This has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, not only keeping the fig tree, think about the tree planted in righteousness by his death, but also think here about how he, by his obedience, that's what it is to wait on the master. Think of a servant, because that's who Christ is. He came as the servant of God, of, of his father. The father spoke of him that way. Behold my servant, mine elect, in whom is all my pleasure. And that servant not moving, unless directed by his master. But here we have a beautiful picture. And this is why we know that God the Father honored his son. How did he honor him? Well, first of all, he did not suffer his soul to see this destruction or corruption in any way. And so he honored him all the way through that work of righteousness that he came to accomplish. And he honored him in the exaltation that is, in his resurrection ascension on high, where scriptures say he's seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede on behalf of that people for whom he paid the debt. So he's honored him. But here's an amazing thing, too, to think that he's honored him with the fruit of his labor. Think about who that fruit is, sinners. And yet the Lord rejoices in everyone that the Father has given him, though they be sinners yet justified by his blood when he finished paying the debt. And now his joy to have throughout eternity everyone that the Father gave him. That's why the writers to Hebrews says that this is his song that he sings with his church. Behold, I and the children whom thou hast given. That's his honor. It's his honor that throughout eternity there will be that great assembly of redeemed and justified, sanctified sinners by his blood, singing one voice. You talk about a choir. 
all the voices of all those for whom he paid the debt from the beginning of time to the end, singing what? Worthy is the lamb that was slain. I'll tell you, all honor and glory belong unto him. And so he that waiteth on his master, I'm thankful he did, because there's not a one of us that could have, but he did in every way satisfied the law, not just the letter of it, but the very spirit of it, and did it on behalf of such sinners as we are. And so all the honor goes unto him, all glory, laud, and honor be to our Savior, Redeemer, and King. And then down in verse 19, again, all of this has to do with reflection on how God deals with his own. Here it says, as in water, face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. If you get some smooth and clear water and you look down in that water, you get a reflection of your face in that water. And the Hebrew language is very cryptic here. Literally, it's as the water, the face to the face. So the man's heart to the man. That's the way literally it's put. Well, I think here of looking into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and seeing him for who he is. And when we look upon him, that, that face answers to face. In other words, he is the answer. He is the remedy. He is all of our glory. When we look in there, we don't want to see our face. We want to see the, the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the heart of man to man, as, as we see him, this speaks to our heart. Knowing that if, if it weren't for that, his face that we would see in that water, and he's the water of life, that there would be no hope. There would be nothing but darkness in this, this heart of ours. So all of this is purpose to show us that in every way that God deals with his own is for his glory and our good. Verse 20, hell and destruction are never full. If it were not for the work of Christ, it speaks here of hell, that's that word sheol, it means the grave, and destruction. That's the, the world beyond what we can see here, it's never full. And unless one is the Lord's, one for whom he's paid the debt, one of these that he counts his friend, then there is nothing but hell and destruction that await the soul. And even so, the eyes of man are never satisfied. People have a consciousness that there is an accountability, there's a judgment to come, they try to deny it. But when reality hits, and so that's why left to themselves, Man's eyes are never satisfied. He's going to left to himself continue to pursue those things that are for his own destruction. There again, we can see the grace of God in not leaving us to ourselves and, and drawing us to ourselves in grace. Otherwise, that would be our end. That would be our lot. Nothing but eternal condemnation and destruction. And so again, verse 21 the purpose of God's dealing with us. Here in verse 17, we started with iron sharpening iron. Here, as the refining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. We would, left ourselves, we would seek the praise. But the Lord purposes the refining pot like you do with silver to remove the dross or the furnace for gold. Job said, though he try me, Yet I will come forth as gold. In other words, the Lord purposes every bit of trial on our behalf to cause us to never put trust in this flesh or never seek the praise of our own. All the praise and honor and glory belongs unto him. But in contrast, verse 22, though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar. This is talking about taking a fool and just pounding him as you will. What comes out? Nothing but a fool. That's all it is. It takes the Spirit of God to convert this heart of ours and cause us to see our abominable nature apart from the grace of God. Because left to ourselves, no matter what the affliction that the Lord would bring, 
yet foolishness is not going to depart from us. We need the work of grace. We need the work of Christ on our behalf. And that's what God does by his grace. Everyone for whom Christ paid the debt, he causes their heart to be turned to Christ. And what difference between the sharpening of the iron, iron sharpens iron with being as one pounded with a pestle and uh, still never being the same. That's why you don't want salvation to be by man's will, because in the end, nothing is going to change this hardened heart, only the grace of God. You stop and think about those who will spend eternity in hell under God's eternal wrath. None of that will produce repentance on their part. The groans and the cries coming up from hell are not out of a desire to repent, but rather out of anger. That's what the scriptures speak of as being a place of, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's, it's that anger will continue forever without ever being able to change those that are subject to that wrath. That's what I see here, though. Thou shouldst bray a, a fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. Such is the hardness of our heart. So if I'm here today as an object of God's grace, then all the grace belongs up to him. So I know my heart that it's nothing but evil and wickedness apart from the grace of God. And the same with you if, if the Lord has paid your debt. That's how he shows you day by day. It's not about us, it's about him. Well, we're going to have to stop there. Pray the Lord will use his word for the exercise of our hearts and to his honor and glory. All right, we'll meet back here in a few minutes.